My name is Ege Kavalalı. I am a professor of pharmacology and the acting chair of the Department of Pharmacology at Vanderbilt. I also hold the title of William Stokes Chair in Experimental Therapeutics in the department. Our lab is primarily a physiology lab that we study function dynamics of neurons, but we do a lot of molecular manipulations to perturb the system and to understand how it's formed, how it's organized, and how it functions. And the philosophy running my lab centers around the individual. I try to create and maintain an atmosphere where originality, critical thinking, and hard work is valued and uh, supported. And this, I think, uh, will make them influential scientists uh, as they transition to more independent positions themselves. My field of study is primarily focused on basic science to understand how synaptic communication between neurons occurs and what kind of signals are sent between neurons and how these are organized and how they actually impact neuronal function. We need to obtain a better understanding of how actually neurons communicate normally, under normal circumstances. Because as we gain a better insight into how a neuron functions normally, we will be able to identify uh, processes that go in the wrong direction under disease circumstances. I think this is quite an important area that might be somewhat uh, neglected in the current thinking, but I think it's still quite um, essential because we really don't understand a lot of fundamentals of neuronal function and uh, communication. My primary advice to students and postdocs, especially in neuroscience, is to focus on the fundamentals. The major discoveries, major uh, leaps forward in understanding usually come from fundamental research, where you can actually discover something so basic that changes the way people look at a, a number of other things. Our, our, uh, focus area is a basic uh, synaptic biology, that synapses are key components of neuronal communication. A neuron forms thousands of synapses uh, uh, to, uh, to communicate with other neurons, and each neuron receives thousands of synapses from other neurons. So several diseases of the nervous system, like neurodegenerative diseases, where synapses are the primary target of degeneration, they actually de degenerate before neurons do. In the meantime, synaptic abnormalities in, abnormalities in synaptic communication are known to underlie several neuropsychiatric disorders as well as neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. So, um, on the other hand, despite this um, uh, in, intense disease relevance, we don't understand uh, as much how the synapses are composed, how they're formed, and how they function. There are certain uh, views that we have that are quite valid in terms of how synapses uh, communicate, but also there are other aspects of synapses that are a total mystery that we would like to understand better, which we think are quite relevant to some of these pathophysiologies. I'm, an, I'm trained as an electrophysiologist, so my background actually originally is in electrical engineering, so that was a rather straightforward transition for me from electrical engineering background to electrophysiology. Electrophysiology, in principle, is measurement of electrical activity of mostly excitable cells, like muscle or also neurons. So I come from that training and that tradition, so therefore we use heavily electrophysiological methods to measure currents generated by these synaptic contacts, the really small currents, one trillionth of an ampere meaning um, uh, uh, in a light bulb typically you know, attracts an ampere of current where these are like a one trillionth of that. Uh, on the other hand, we also use a lot of optical tools. That's uh, fluorescence imaging. So we introduce probes that are fluorescent that actually emit light in response to um, light stimulation. And we introduce these probes into synapses and neurons and we could also use, use those methods to, to measure and study these uh, functions of the synaptic contact. Uh, so the primary uh, impetus for me to become a neurobiologist was uh, originated from my background in electrical engineering. 
So I enjoyed, I studied electrical engineering in Istanbul, Turkey. That was my undergraduate uh, work in uh, Boğaziçi University. Initially, I was interested in uh, solid state physics, but then later I gradually navigated towards uh, neurobiology when I realized that the tools and the techniques that I've learned as an electrical engineer will be quite instrumental to uncover uh, neuronal function and how neurons communicate and store information. In, in regard to success stories from my lab, uh, I have been very lucky, as I indicated, uh, to actually work with really talented individuals. And uh, at the same time, I had a very diverse lab in the sense that it was been very international. So I currently have uh, uh, former postdoctoral fellows or graduate students who actually are uh, f have faculty positions in uh, Turkey, in uh, Argentina, in uh, South Korea, and uh, also in the United States. So um, they are independent, they are known for their own work uh, by now. So I've been, I've been independent and running a lab for now more than 20 years. So there is, a, if you will, a pedigree that originated from my lab of really successful and accomplished individuals that I'm very proud of their uh, work in a way sometimes more than my own work. Our studies over the years have uncovered that uh, neurotransmitters um, are released by multiple uh, processes. So um, it was known before that neurotransmitters can be released in response to uh, nerve impulses, but also they can be released spontaneously without any nerve impulse. What we could show is that uh, this release of neurotransmitters in the absence of nerve, nerve impulses is also a physiologically relevant process and it is regulated independent of the neurocommunication that normally uh, occurs in response to nerve impulses. So what is called uh, spontaneous release, if you will, that's the, the, the way um, the, that's uh, generally uh, called in the field. We think uh, our studies suggest that it's actually a critical process for neuronal homeostasis, maintenance of synapses, and it is regulated independent of the regulation of uh, action potential or nerve impulse uh, triggered neurotransmission. The, the concept of diversity is, I consider this as, a, a, let's say, a second nature, the way I look at the world. Uh, mainly because of my background growing up in Istanbul, which is a very cosmopolitan city with a lot of different cultures and uh, historically and currently different religions that come together. My lab has been quite diverse, uh, exactly in the same way as, um, in a way, my environment growing up. And, um, and I think it's, it's essential, it's, it's inevitable and it's essential in many ways. It brings different life perspectives, different insights, and, uh, and one of the major things to avoid in science is groupthink, which people can, you know, without uh, critical insight, can actually follow a certain hypothesis, a certain direction, without uh, thinking too much or criticizing or delving into um, the depth of a uh, certain question. So uh, diversity is, is wonderful in many respects, but I think is also a scientific imperative so that we keep an open mind so we really uh, test our questions and hypotheses in multiple directions, in multiple ways. At the end, we need to reach a certain consensus, but I think a diverse environment in the lab actually helps to reach uh, better conclusions and uh, more uh, long-lasting uh, outcomes. The reason I uh, have joined Vanderbilt two and a half years ago is primarily due to uh, Vanderbilt's quite generous and kind effort to recruit uh, my wife, Lisa Montegia, to be the director of the Brain Institute, Vanderbilt Brain Institute. And along her recruitment, Vanderbilt was also quite generous and kind to actually bring me on board and our family. And uh, so we moved from Dallas, Texas, and I used to be a faculty member in the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center for almost 19 years. Uh, but it was a good time to make a transition and to from a research intense medical school environment to a, a major research university with a more diverse, let's say, an intellectual portfolio. Um, so when I recruit a student or a postdoc, first I would like to make sure that they are genuinely interested in the scientific direction that our lab had pursued. 
So I think there has to be some level of match or a, a sharing of perspectives, if you will. Uh, on the other hand, I definitely uh, uh, um, admire an independent critical mind and then also uh, uh, people with a, maybe a certain level of sense of urgency to actually accomplish, to move forward with their careers and lives. But also diversity in an individual's uh, intellectual um, uh, worldview. So yes, we need a great scientist and great uh, technical skills, but also having a wider worldview, I think is important to bring in a depth such that over years, over times, people can actually maintain a, a vibrant uh, intellect and uh, contribute to science in a creative way.